You're having fun while you're learning, and, and therefore you want to learn more because you'll have fun. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the podcast that's going to send you to the hospital. Well, take take you to a hospital, uh, a rehab hospital for for birds. But still, I sounded very dangerous and intimidating, right? Wait, why would the goal of an intro to a podcast be to make somebody sound dangerous and intimidating? Who wrote this? Oh, it. It was me. It was me. Anyway, that was the longest one of these dumb jokes to say welcome to the Rasafari podcast. So a couple quick things before we get to our intro to the interview today. Just a friendly reminder, rasafari.com is where you can go to check out the website for the show. Patreon.com slash Rossafari is where you can go to support the pod. And make sure you're following along on all the socials at Rossafari, except for TikTok, which is at Rossafari Pod. But that's enough about the show, and I'm even going to skip my usual kind of lengthy intro about my life because I want to get to it today, y'all. This is a really exciting episode for me to share with you because it's a bit of a sequel. But the good news is, unlike our favorite Marvel movies, which if you haven't seen all 487 of them, you won't understand the next one. This one, this one's an okay independent listen. It it really is. You don't have to have heard the first one to get 95% of what you're going to hear in this episode. Now, with that said, I do want to highly recommend that you pause here and head all the way back to episode 17 from September 17th of 2020 and listen to the Vinterview, because that is the episode from the first time I went to Vin's, and this is the second episode that I'm bringing you from Vin's. And if you don't know what Vins is, then you really need to go back and catch up. But the cool part is that you can listen in either order. So you can listen to this episode first and then go back or vice versa. Because we are talking to Gray O'Toole and Anna Morris, who you heard on that episode from Vins. VINS, which stands for the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences, is an amazing raptor rehab center and education center. And, um, oh, it's just really cool and it's really different. And I really can't wait to share it with all of you again. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have some fun with this one, y'all. Anna and Gray are honestly not only two of my favorite people that I've had on the podcast, but have two of my favorite voices that have ever been on the podcast. Not because of accents, which is what I normally get excited about, but uh, they're just really calming, fun. I don't know. You can just hear their personalities in their voices. But beyond that, the even cooler thing here is that we don't just do an interview Because after the interview, we are headed into the bird rehab hospital to meet some animals and learn all about how that hospital is set up. And hey, you may remember from the first episode that uh, I got really excited about an animal at Vins that wasn't a bird. Well, the same thing happens in our audio from the hospital here. So let's just say that uh, I am a bird nerd, but I also like turtles and the species that you'll hear on this episode. I don't want to give it away, but the name is Bear, and it's not a bear. Although a bear named Bear would be cool. Anyway, here's an ad. Today's episode is brought to you by Daydreamers Studios. Do you have stories and expertise to share with the world? Have you ever thought about starting your own podcasts? There's no better time to start than now with the help of a trusted production partner. 
Daydreamer Studios is a full-service production company that takes all the stress off your plate. You can focus on creating engaging content while they focus on recording, editing, audio engineering, hosting, and publishing on 22 platforms. Log into the advanced remote system with one click and the Daydreamer team will be on the other end ready for you to record everything you have to say. Owned and operated by Daydreamer Network, Daydreamer Studios continues on the company's mission to empower storytellers of all kinds by making podcasting accessible to all. For more information and current promotions, visit daydreamernetwork.com slash studios. And here's an interview with Gray O'Toole and Anna Morris of the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences, also known as VINS. All right, so we are back at VINS uh, with two of my favorite early guests from the podcast. But uh, in case people missed those episodes, why don't we start off with you both telling me who you are and what you do here? Sure. I'm Anna Morris, and I'm the lead environmental educator here, which means I'm sort of on the ground running our uh, environmental education programs with our ambassador raptors. And I'm Gray O'Toole, the director of our rehab department here at VINS. And yeah, I pretty much take care of permitting and all the birds on campus. Yeah. yeah. So and the rehab department includes a hospital. Right. Yes. And it's it's been slightly busy, I hear. But we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. Um, but that's very cool. So uh, what's new, y'all, with, with both of you? Like life, VINs, all the things. How's it going? All the things. Yeah, we, um, we've been growing, like, exponentially, it seems. You know, I think 2020 was a weird year for everybody. And it was, of course, weird for us. We had to be closed for the public for some time. Um, and then when we came back, we were on sort of reduced programming, which was weird for us as the educators um, and weird for the birds, too. But we had a lot of opportunities to do um, some more training, some more creative behaviors with our birds and to, to grow and learn a lot as trainers and educators ourselves. Um, and then as we've been back in 2021, sort of at full full capacity again, uh, it seems like everyone's coming out of the woodwork and we've seen almost 40,000 people since April which used to be the amount of people we would see in an entire year. Wow. So people want to come and see us, and we love that. <laughs> that is amazing. And we are recording this on August 20th. It won't be out for a while. So when you're listening to this, that, that's even more impressive than, you know, another, <laughs> like, two months from now when this comes out. So that's, that's really <laughs> right. cool. Um, and before we get to you, Gray, um, what, uh, you mentioned that it was weird for the birds. So tell me, how do you know that? And, and why was it weird for the birds? And, and, you know, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, it was weird for the birds in the sense that we um, weren't doing nearly as many of the programs. We, we do daily programs with them. So pretty much every bird in our education ambassador collection is asked to come out and sit on a glove and meet a bunch of strangers once a day, every day. And that wasn't happening. And so they got out of practice. There were definitely birds that they stopped wanting to go into their travel crate. Um, because simply because they hadn't done it in a while. And that's a big ask <laughs> for our birds. So as birds used to being out in the wide open spaces, uh, hair go into this tiny little box. They were like, I don't have to, so I'm not gonna. <laughs> um, so we had to work on that again. Um, and also kind of the spaces that we use have changed. We used to do programs with a large group of people gathered indoors. And I don't know if we're really ever going to do that again. <laughs> um, <laughs> who knows, though? Uh, so we've been able to utilize uh, our that indoor amphitheater space for training. And so the birds have gotten really, really comfortable in that space. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, using like a, like a speaker um, tower as a perch, which is probably not great for the speaker tower, but <laughs> they're super comfortable with it. Um, and, and we think that's great. We think, you know, the more confident they, they can grow. So there's been, there's been definitely some benefits to having that break in the amount that we asked them to do in that they could build their confidence. Yeah. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So, Gray, what's new for you? Well, <laughs> I would have to say it's, it's more of the same um, COVID definitely was chaotic for everybody, and we had kind of assumed that we would see less patients um, just because more people were uh, at work again and not seeing 
birds in their backyard, but that has been the complete opposite of really? what we have been seeing. So we're currently at 902 patients, and last year we ended at 1,025, so we're 100% going to surpass that um, fairly soon. So it's been a very, very busy summer for sure. Uh, it's been nice having our volunteers back, so we've been needing all the extra help that we <laughs> that we could get. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I remember that you said that last year was your busiest year by like a lot, and now you're just going to shatter that record. Yes, it it feels like exponential growth. Every <laughs> every year we increase by hundreds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To put it in context, like when I'm doing our educational programs, I. I was trained to say we see an average of 500 patients a year, <laughs> and now I'm like, uh, I don't know what our average is anymore. Yeah, and I will say I we get radio calls all the time from people who are driving over, and they're they're saying, "Hey, Swibber, we have a we have a bird on the way," and I think to myself, "Of course we do. We we always <laughs> we always do." <laughs> there we get easily five to ten a day sometimes. Yeah. That's that's incredible. Wow. <laughs> um, so the last time that we, we talked, it was hypothesized, and I know that we are, we are in the world of hypothesis now, and that's fine, but it was hypothesized that the reason that you were seeing so many more birds was because, like you said, so many people were out of work, were not allowed to do things inside, so they were going out into nature where they were finding more injured birds. So birds probably weren't being injured at a higher rate, but were just being found at a higher rate. Now those numbers have shifted back from people being in the office, like you said, and the numbers continue to grow. So care to hypothesize why that may be? I, I really don't know, but I, I think I say it a lot that our social media and just our presence in the state of Vermont has become, uh, we're just a lot more well-known in, in the area, I think, with our, our Facebook and Instagram. People, people know about us, um, so yeah, they're, I, they're more I heard likely. That you got pretty popular after uh, this, this podcast interview you did. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, oh, right up there. <laughs> we're superstars. Yeah. <laughs> no, that actually makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that's something that more facilities should consider, honestly. Like... Mm -hmm. You don't think of needing to advertise mm -hmm. yourself in those terms. You need to advertise in terms of getting guests here and, and to get your, your income that way and everything. But if you can become a famous rehab, for lack of a better way to put it, <laughs> then more people will be aware and will think, oh, I should call that that place, that Vin's place. And mm -hmm. yeah, that, that makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, very, very cool. Um, do y'all have like a dedicated social media team or, or how does that work? We do, yeah. I was going to say shout out to Emily Johnson. Um, she's our social, she's our one woman social media team. Nice. Um, uh, she's fantastic, and she has also been helping us develop a lot of educational content around some of the conservation issues that birds face. So, uh, back in 2019, there was that study published about the three billion birds lost from North America over the last 50 years. And we did a big initiative uh, here to raise awareness about that, about the things that people can do in their own lives to help um, birds and the ways that people can advocate for governments to do more to help bird life. Um, so Emily put together a whole series of videos where, that we put on our YouTube channel and all our social media to encourage people to, to do the right thing by birds because there's a lot that individuals can do. Um, and it's, I think that's uh, been a really, really great way that we've grown as well as more more conservation focused messaging that's awesome i am a huge fan of that and in light of that uh conservation message me talk to me a little bit about what people can do to help birds absolutely yeah i i always remember this actually because we put it to a song um please tell me I you're gonna not sing, sing this no, no i'm not gonna on. sing um but it helps me remember what order they go in so there's um uh Seven simple actions that we say that individuals can do to help birds. Um, you can make windows safe. Birds often collide with windows. And so using either um, what we call them zen curtains. You can see these ropes on these windows back here. They move in the breeze, and so they um, sort of break up the reflection that the birds see in the window. Making windows safe. Keeping cats indoors is another big thing because cats uh, can be very, very harmful to the bird life around them. Um, Plant native plants. 
that birds can use as food sources. You can see her singing the song in her head <laughs> I'm, right I'm now. I'm singing the song in my head right now. Um, avoid pesticide use, so not spraying for, for herbicides or insecticides. Oh, shade-grown coffee. That's another one. Drinking yes. shade-grown coffee. That's a big thing. There are a couple of brands, uh, actually several different coffee companies in Vermont that are specifically shade-grown, bird-friendly, and it usually says so right on the label. It's something coffee companies like to brag about, and for good reason. Um, plastic. Yeah, plastic. <laughs> Reduce your plastic waste, um, so using reusable containers and whatnot, and participate in citizen science programs like Nest Watch, like Feeder Watch. Um, we have, uh, that's another thing that has changed over the last year. We have a whole research department now within VINS. So. I'm so excited to talk about yeah, that. Yeah. We, we will get there. I oh, absolutely. Don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just getting involved in the bird life in your community and learning more about it and helping scientists to learn more about it. Those are the seven simple things that you can do in your life to help birds around you. What uh, what what melody is your song set? To? It was uh, so I didn't write it. Uh, it was um, uh, former educator Nathan Tholey who oh. set it to the tune of um, "The Break in the Middle of Shake It Off" by Taylor <laughs> Swift. <laughs> okay, I was expecting like "Pop Goes the Weasel." Nope, nope, <laughs> nope. It was, it was "Shake It Off." <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to sing it for us? <laughs> if you can record Nathan singing it, I think that would be perfect. You just slip it in there. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that that's those are all really great uh, things. Um, and I'm curious. I know that uh, birding has become a more popular thing lately, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, how can birders help birds? Yeah. Well, you know, any of those any of those things mentioned, but um, one of the big things that I see um, as a, a call out that we're often involved in is when there's ever a rare bird sighting, which can be really cool. And especially up here, we sometimes get snowy owls that come down from the Arctic or great gray owls. Those are like big charismatic birds. Everybody wants a chance to see that bird. And if everybody goes to see that bird, chances are you're going to stress it out a lot and it's going to become fearful and and probably not be able to stay in one place to get enough food for itself. So um, a lot of birders are are becoming more aware of this and being you know more courteous of, to the birds themselves. It's really cool to go and see them and take a picture, but um, sometimes it's it's uh, a better idea to not disclose the location of a really cool charismatic bird just so that you don't have hundreds and hundreds of people trying to show up and, and do the same. Uh, I think it's really admirable, like people are brought together by nature in that way, but it can have that inadvertent side effect. Yeah. And I will say uh, backyard birders are also really crucial in actually tracking disease. Mm -hmm. So we get many, many calls from people who see finches that have eyes that are a little crusty or some of the birds look a little puffy and not right at the feeder. Um, so it is a really great opportunity for us to know if there is uh, conjunctivitis, salmonella, or any other strange disease that we need to know about in the area so that we can help um, educate the public about that and uh, potentially talk to the state about what we can do to kind of mitigate that issue. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Cool. All right. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the hospital. I know that it's having... Oh. Boy, did those eyes get big. Um, so uh, I know that it, it's having a record year, as you said. Um, but, like, how are things going? What are your numbers like other than just, you know, admissions? And, um, yeah, how are things? Uh, things are crazy. So, <laughs> um, 
We have currently 902 patients admitted. Like I said, uh, we actually just got a Cooper's Hawk in right before I came nice. <laughs> came here. Um, it has been total chaos, and I would have to say over half of those intakes uh, have all been baby birds, so nestlings, fledglings, raptors, waterfowl, songbirds, um, all of all of the stuff, um, and. We, we've we been seeing a lot of really great different species that we normally don't see. We got in a, a nestling osprey that we actually were able to find a foster nest for. Nice. We, we were able to reunite some barred owl babies with parents, re-nest broadwing hawk babies. So there's been a lot of really great success stories and, and just really fun, fun things. We've gotten a lot of kestrels in, which are my favorite bird. So I've been pretty happy with that <laughs> nice how do you find a foster nest for an osprey this sounds like a story um yes yeah. so the the nestling was just found on the ground it had clearly fallen out of a nest and parents had abandoned it so we we took it in and i actually talked to uh, a gentleman at vermont fish and game and he actually tracks uh all the nests in the state of vermont i asked him if he knew of a nest that we could pen- potentially use um that had some some babies in it and the parents were still around and they were roughly the same age so we were kind of able to uh pick one out that he thought was going to be a really good fit and uh brought a bucket truck out and just loaded the bird on up and plopped him in the nest and the parents were around the babies uh immediately took to him and actually i just Got an email the other day that all three, so he had two foster siblings, all three of them actually fledged out of the nest and have been sighted flying around and are doing really, really great. So Nice. Yeah. That's really cool to hear. Yeah, it's kind of the best feeling ever to, to have a bird, not only to see it flying free and released, but also that whole re-nesting process. You know, we always tell people that a baby bird's best parents are its own parents and and barring that another of its own species so you know gray doesn't give herself enough credit she says it's chaos over there they're expert excellent excellent rehabbers but you know a a baby bird's own parents are going to do a much better job and so being able to put them right back in the nest is like very satisfying yeah and to put it into perspective too we would probably still have that nestling osprey if we didn't re-nest it which would have been a lot of care and a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> so I am um, I'm, I'm looking through the trees at your, your little hospital here. How the heck do you have 900 birds over there? Like, just from a logistical standpoint, how does this work? Because it, it, it looks like a great facility, like not knocking anything here. But it's just 900 birds is like a lot of birds. Like, I think, yeah, that seems like a lot of birds. So how, how? Talk to me about this. How does this work? It is a lot of birds. And we pretty much have to find space where there isn't space anymore. <laughs> um, it, we do definitely have plans to try to expand a little bit more in the future just because we're seeing so many more patients than we ever expected we'd be seeing. So uh, we're, we're basically making enclosures where enclosures generally wouldn't have been and uh or making one enclosure into three separate enclosures to house all of these different species um we also are in the process of building a waterfowl enclosure so we have a very specific enclosure with a huge uh basically like a hot tub almost (laughs) size pool that we're um, very, very excited to have for next year for all of our waterfowl babies. And so we are definitely expanding and uh, trying to find more space to get some more enclosures built. Yeah, that makes sense. And to be clear, um, you know, since this podcast focuses on a lot of zoos and stuff, we often talk about how important exhibit size is and all of that kind of thing. And, and But in a hospital, it's different. Right. You you need obviously some enough space, but we don't need big, huge exhibits and they're not flying around and doing all kinds of behaviors and stuff like that. Right. It it takes less space to properly rehab a bird. Is that correct? So it is 
fairly species dependent. When they initially come in, we do try to confine them um, into shorter or smaller spaces uh, just because they're injured and we want to make sure that they're not making an injury worse. Uh, we do have different requirements. There actually was a whole new book published um, called Standards in Wildlife Rehabilitation that gives uh, all sorts of enclosure measurements and the needs of specific species. So um, in general, they don't need as much space, but we do like to uh, flight test a lot of our birds. So those require larger enclosures to make sure that they're they're getting sufficient exercise so that we were confident that they're ready for release. Uh, so it really is very species dependent. Makes sense. Cool, cool. All right. So uh, let's, uh, ha- well, before we get to, to the non-hospital part of VINs, has anything new other than numbers uh, happened or gone on that you're excited about in the hospital? Um. Yeah, I would say that we have been making greater strides in research. Nice. So my coworker Bren Lundborg um, does a lot of the research aspect of um, uh, of rehab, basically. So we are kind of getting uh, a bunch of different. So we're gathering uh, data on blood parasites in the state of Vermont, and uh, it's just kind of a comprehensive study to just know kind of what's out there because there really isn't a study like that in Vermont. So he's been working on that. There's many, many blood smears to go through. So it's going to be quite a process, but we're also contributing to other research um, in uh, looking at uh, malaria in loons, common loons. And we have been helping fish and game if we get ruffed grouse species uh, looking to see if there's any potential that they have West Nile. So we, we get samples for that. So we do have um, quite a few studies that we're kind of contributing to, which is really important for the rehab community in general because there isn't a whole lot of research on, on stuff like that. So it's really important uh, to have that so that we kind of know what to do in the future, how we can best take care of uh, these species that have malaria or West Nile or how... Uh, how much or how many blood parasites are, are common in a broad wing hawk? When should we be concerned? Stuff like that. How common is that for rehabs in general? And like how much communication is there in the community uh, when you guys do do those kinds of studies? Um, so we mostly reach out to the state um, or they reach out to us. And we actually do get a lot of graduate students who are who are doing other research, uh, and we kind of help contribute to that as well. Um, but it kind of is a two-way street where we kind of keep uh, keep our ears out for, for anything and, and see if we can kind of help out in that regard. But we do get reached out by, by quite a few people who are, are looking to do their own personal studies, and we, we're always help, happy to contribute to that. That's cool. I know that um, the zoo community has a bunch of shared boards for their vets and for um, just keepers and stuff where they'll share information. Is there anything like that in the rehab world? Do you guys participate in any kind of knowledge sharing, you know, with others? So I I would have to say probably the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association website is, is the best resource for rehabbers or the International Wildlife Rehabilitators Council. They both, uh, they... They post different publications, different articles that kind of rehab facilities are doing all over the U.S. and beyond. And um, so it's a a great resource to kind of see what other centers are doing. And it's all in one spot. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So let's talk about the rest of VINs. Uh, Tell me about some of the new stuff that's been going on. Yeah, well, we're we're excited to have um, programs back up and running, and um, shout out to the team of educators this year. We've had uh, the biggest group of us that we've had in years. There are seven of us doing the programs and caring for our ambassador collection this year, which has been really awesome and fun, and um, a lot of people bringing a lot of uh, different experience from the zoo world. Um, <laughs> I think we said in the last podcast, like, Vince is not a zoo, we're, we don't have AZA accreditation. That's not something we would really qualify for. Right, because, because it's of not our, this kind of facility. Exactly, because yeah. yeah. of what we have here. But um, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can learn from those uh, places and apply um, the, you know, the training and the husbandry where we can. So it's been great to learn from our, our seasonal employees with different experiences uh, this year. 
and be able to um, also use their knowledge and expertise and apply that to our bird training. So usually in the summertime, I like take on people who maybe they've never handled a bird of prey before and train them to do that. And by the end of the summer, they're very confident bird handlers. Um, But this summer, I feel like I take on some people who've definitely handled birds before and introduce them to more of the positive reinforcement training esoterica. And by the end of the summer, they're like very competent bird trainers. Um, So we've been able to um, start teaching our barn owl to hover on cue, which is awesome. Um, I I don't take any credit for that. That's all. That's all the barn owl (laughs) offering the behavior at the end of the day. He's like, it's food time. Is it food time? And he's just hovering in his doorway. So we were like, okay, we're going to we're going to put this on a queue actually and take take it into uh, our program. So <laughs> hopefully over the winter um we'll be able to demonstrate the that natural behavior that they have. Um and one of my colleagues, uh Anastasia has been working on a hover behavior with our kestrel as nice. well for a long time. So they're doing awesome. And um just sort of also finding new things to do for old birds. Um our in our education collection, we've got a uh, red-tailed hawk, Bloomfield, who's been with us for 25 years. Um, in the last year or two, we started her on some arthritis medication because that's old. That's yep. an old red tail. Uh, and so we've taken her off of doing flight demonstrations in programs because of that, but we're still trying to keep her exercise. So she's doing a, a few sort of different things, as well as our uh, rough-legged hawk, who has a, also a wing injury. Her flights sort of deteriorate in the summer because a rough-legged hawk is an Arctic species of raptor. So when it's this hot out, she doesn't feel like doing anything. Um, Same. (laughs) But she will. She is willing to, uh, you know, uh, chase a piece of food around on the ground, which is super adorable, as you can imagine. (laughs) This, like, really fluffy-legged brown bird just with her wings out running. Um, (laughs) And as well as she just likes sitting pretty on a perch and getting sprayed with a bottle of cool water and... You know, that's I'd watch that all day long, and our visitors uh, do the same. Yeah, <laughs> nice, very cool. So, is is training definitely more of a focus now? I think so, at, at least for me, especially um, as kind of. Um, uh, fortunately, I'm, I have a, a sort of counterpart now. I have another full time, uh, permanent year round educator, uh, Caitlin Robert, and so she, her coming onto the team has allowed me to focus more on the training and getting our our program behaviors that much more. Uh, solid so because she can take away some of my other duties it's like i used to do the job of two people and now i now i only do the job of one person this feels good (laughs) (laughs) that is that is awesome um bird training has become a big uh thing on the podcast because of uh danny portier larson and then uh emily begay down at southwick's two people Mm -hmm. that i interviewed and i I know you have someone here from southwick's um, yeah kate belleville yeah and um I just love how small this world is. And I know. I love knowing that, like, as you guys are focusing more on training, mm-hmm. you got somebody who worked with, uh, especially in Danny, one of the best trainers out there right now. I have, mm-hmm. I have been there. I've seen the work that they are doing. It's incredible. It's time for Interrupting. 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 Interrupting John. Mm. Okay, y'all, I had to interrupt this for one major story from Southwick's Zoo. It's really cool, and I apologize to Vins, but I had to share this. I'm actually putting this episode together on Halloween, October 31st. And um, earlier today, because of the tour I'm on, I got to visit Southwick's Zoo and see my friends Danny and Emily, and it was wonderful. But even more wonderful than seeing those two goobers was the fact that I not only got to see my buddy Russell Crow, the Pied Crow, but I actually got to assist with his training. If you've listened to Danny and Emily's episodes, you know that Russell has been a training journey. At first, Danny was the only person that could work with Russell. And over the years, he's gotten better and is now able to be worked with by all of the bird staff at the zoo. However, until today, he had never worked with a non-staff member. 
But in a very carefully controlled environment and with Danny being right there and hyper aware of the entire situation and and letting me know that, you know, we would only try stuff if he seemed into it and such, I got to go in to the free flight area and help Russell with his training. We were doing recycling training. I would hand him a plastic bottle and he would put it in a recycling bin and then get a positive reinforcer. In this case, gross meat that I got to hold that was raw. But he didn't think it was gross. And uh, it was just really cool. It was a really big deal, not just for me getting to do that, but for everyone on the Southwick's bird team because it shows how much he's learning and how much they have figured out how to do what's right by Russell. And it was just such a magical experience. And I will be sure to show video from that on Instagram and Facebook. So make sure you check it out. And I love Southwick Zoo, but I also love Vins and I love how it all ties together. And so, okay, let's get back to the interview. Uh, excuse me, I mean, the Vinter 2. Um, you know, and she's so focused and she's learned right from Hillary Hankey and, and mm-hmm. some of these other amazing people out there. Oh, yeah. And now one of her protégés is here. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about how all that stuff seems to work out. You know? It really does. It's such a tiny little world. When you get into the world of, like, expert bird trainers, you're, you're not, there's not a lot of people. Um, but, yeah, it's it's been a really cool thing to, to grow as part of that community. Um I uh, love that, um, you know, Hillary has this sort of uh, subscription thing. I don't know how you would describe it. It's a a website where you can go and and, um, watch videos that her and her team produce, um, as well as the IAATE is an organization of avian trainers and educators that um, hosts a conference every year that I got to go to last March. Nice. Because it was digitally. Hey, digital is. conferences. I was just going to say, how did anyone get to go to anything last year? But that makes Zoom, sense. Zoom, that's, yeah. how. that's how. Yeah. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah, and it's like seeing these familiar faces over and over again. Through the IAATE, actually, we um, got to have a professional mentor uh, assigned to us. We had to apply for to the professional development committee, but I thought it'd be great to have someone from the outside um, helping us along with our training. And we got matched with Erin Katzner, who's over at the Peregrine Fund, who I had worked with her husband when I was in graduate school in Boise. <laughs> and, then, and now she's our IAAT mentor. So yeah, it's a tiny, teeny little world. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. So you also mentioned a research department. Yeah. Talk to me about your research department. I wish Jim Armbruster were here to talk about the research yeah, department. I'm going to reach out to Jim. I think, I think we may be, be having Jim on the podcast a little bit later. Yeah, we'll absolutely. See. Yeah. So our research department has grown out of, um, you know, research has always been part of our mission at VINS. And uh, our research department used to be much larger. And that actually kind of uh, became its own organization uh, uh, many years ago called the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Um, so VINS has been sort of like missing that, that part of itself for a while now. So we're trying to get back into the world of conducting our own scientific projects. You know, citizen science participation is one thing. Um, I think we do it very well. But uh, developing our own research questions and having the resources to go answer them has been really great. So um, over the past winter, Jim, um, actually, this is a good small world story as well. Jim uh, got in touch with a researcher who was looking at um, the wintering behavior of red tail hawks up in Addison County. So it's about, about two hours north of here. So um, with the guidance and the permitting of that graduate student, um, he was able to go out and trap red tail hawks and put um, satellite tracking devices on them so we could see, like, physically what three trees this red-tailed hawk spent 80% of the winter in um, and map that data. And it's been uh, really, really cool and enlightening to see that. The graduate student was the only other student in my cohort in graduate school in Boise, Bryce Robinson. So um, when Jim was like, hey, you know this guy, his name is Bryce Robinson. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That Small world. Amazing. Yeah, Small it world. really is. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm constantly doing interviews. And, mm-hmm. Like, I feel like half of the people that I've interviewed worked at Elmwood Park Zoo, which is a small zoo right by where yeah. I live. And I'm like, how? How have you all been there? They don't have that large of a staff. But, <laughs> yeah, it all it all works out. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. 
It's the seasonal life, too. I mean, a lot of True. people cycle through. I know nature centers very much and probably zoos as well. Yeah, no, the same is true in, in my world in theater, and especially mm-hmm. doing the actor-musician shows that I do where mm-hmm. I'm on stage playing an instrument. There's a large but small group of us, and we all end up doing shows together, and we all, um, the last show I was doing before coming up here down in Florida, uh, the bass player and I, have both been told for years, like, oh, my gosh, you guys need to work together. Like, we've known each other's names. We follow each other. We've had conversations digitally, but we'd never played together. Mm. And the second that we started playing together, we were like, yeah, this is good. This makes sense. No no wonder, like, 80 people said you guys should work together. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I love that kind of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really cool about the research department. Yeah, yeah. And uh, really we're excited. doing we're doing some some growth with the training stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about the shows a little bit. Yeah, so we do. Um, and I will say, because my supervisor will want me to say this, and I want to say <laughs> this as well. I do, truthfully. We call them programs or presentations. And the reason why we do so is because the emphasis is on education. Right, right. Um, the birds that we have, uh, most of them we have them because they couldn't live anywhere else. And so their their role now is to be educators. So the term, you know, program hopefully instills in the audience a more like, okay, I'm here to learn something rather than a show, which is I might be here to be entertained. Uh, we hope the programs are entertaining anyway, Um that's, that's always our goal is to show people things that will be memorable mm-hmm. as well. Something they're going to see and say, whoa, okay, now I, now I get it. Um, so typically we do um, four birds of prey in our programs and we'll feature a hawk, a falcon, an owl, and um, usually another hawk because we have a uh, Harris's hawk that does free flight over the audience. Nice. Um, so that's, that's really the, the kicker for a lot of people. We've had people being like, when's the hawk going to fly over my head? Like in the middle of the owl presentation. And I'm like, there's an owl though. Um, yeah. So uh, typically we have our, our two programs at the either end of the day, our free flight program. So you'll get to see a bird do some flights um, as well as some birds that sit on glove. We talk about their natural history and I've been um, putting an emphasis on conservation stories as well. So each of the species that we talk about, there are many different uh, angles to talk about what an individual can do to help in species conservation from, uh, you know, not cutting down every dead tree in, in the forest because that's great habitat for screech owls to advocating for um, better climate change legislation to help birds like the rough-legged hawk and the Arctic species. So we always try to have that, that messaging in there um, when people see Something cool, like a Harris hawk fly right over their head. I want them to remember that this bird lives in the desert, and the desert is a hugely important biodiverse habitat. Yeah, Absolutely. That's something that I've actually been debating with some people, um, like fun debates but discussing, Mm -hmm. um, is education versus entertainment. Mm -hmm. And especially talking about zoos, you know, um, where where maybe it's a little more people come to be entertained. Yeah. And I... with a podcast, you know, people come to be entertained. Um, you know, I, I told you guys before we started that I've been listening back. I, li- I listened back to our, our first episode and I was all stoic John trying <laughs> to be all, mm, I am an educator. And, um, I have, my reach has, <laughs> I can't, I don't even remember. I think I was doing like 300 downloads a week when we interviewed and I'm doing 1500 downloads oh, a week nice. right now. Like yeah. once I relaxed and started being goofy and yeah. making jokes and yeah. dumb puns and all that But people also learn the facts, you know, and I recently saw it's just a banner at Zoo Miami and I have not had the time to do the research myself yet. But um, it it posits that 95 percent of your learning happens while being entertained. Mm -hmm. And then I think about things like Sesame Street, which I didn't tune in to learn how to count 10 in Spanish. (laughs) I tuned in because I thought Oscar the Grouch was hilarious. Um, But. I also learned how to count to 10 in Spanish, yeah. you know, and I, I think it's interesting um, and I don't think there is a right answer. You know, if yeah. you use the term shows, will more people come to be to get the to spectacle be and be educated. entertained and then also accidentally right. to them, not to you, obviously, mm-hmm. get ed- educated? Or if you call it programs, are you being more upfront and then people who want to learn are more likely to come? And I, I think it's an interesting balance. I'd love yeah. to hear if either of you have any thoughts on that. But again, I truly don't think there's a right or wrong either. Yeah, it's uh, I I can kind of agree with you there, and I've come around to the use of the word show for all of those reasons that you cited that it might, and, and also because 
people come up and ask me every day here at Vins, where's the show? Um, and I'll say, oh, the program is going to be. <laughs> right, and then right. I feel like, well, why am I even doing this? They, <laughs> they know what they're coming to see. Um, so, yeah, it's obviously I think the an ideal world is a, is a great fusion of the two. You're having fun while you're learning. And, and therefore, you want to learn more because you'll have fun. And that positive reinforcement cycle. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, literally it's just all, training. It's all, it's just, all training. just training. <laughs> Everything is training. <laughs> I bet your husband is very well behaved. I'm just saying. <laughs> he would disagree, but he's wrong. <laughs> do you have any thoughts, Greg? I don't think I do. I didn't actually. think you did. Gray yeah. has this amazing ability where whenever she has something to say, she dives at the mic. Yeah. And as soon as she's done, she dives away. And if I ask yeah. a question that she doesn't have an answer for or she wants to let Anna talk, she literally, like, <laughs> she looks afraid of the microphone, honestly. It's quite entertaining. <laughs> I wish you all could see it. But uh, Yeah, and then I will say, and I've known Gray for years now, knowing that... Um, you know, the word show probably also makes you want to run away and hide, right? If I ever asked you, oh, hey, Gray, could you speak the, the program today? You would be like, what? Why would you ask me such a thing? Gray is very, um, very rehab focused and not, not into the education so much. It would not be a good program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair. Yeah. But hey, it, it takes all types. That's... Um, been one of my I find that I have unintentional focuses in groups of episodes where like as I talk to people the same theme comes up not because of questions I ask but it just it seems that like we'll reinforce the same theme or the same animals mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and something that came up a lot in my interviews in Florida which I'm now releasing um, was that to be involved in conservation it really takes all types and mm -hmm. not everyone is made to be a zookeeper I'm not made to be a zookeeper. I like audiences cheering for me. And um, I also, you know, I've, I've done volunteer work at zoos and I've helped out with things and I have, you know, cleaned an otter pool and it wasn't my favorite day. And I, I mean, I, I was grateful to be there and helping out, but I think I fell asleep at 730 that night. I was pretty sore, you know, like that's just not who I am. But I can have a goofy podcast and drop some puns and some knowledge and introduce the world to y'all. And, and that actually helps conservation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it takes rehabbers who do not want to talk to humans. <laughs> and it takes people who want to talk to humans who mm -hmm. maybe don't want to spend all day rehabbing birds. And, stuff. and I, I just mm -hmm. think that's been something that I've really been focused on because, honestly, when I first got into the podcast, I had this thought that, like, it was going to lead me into maybe getting into zookeeping or maybe getting into, you know, like, like I'm so passionate about it and, and what can a podcast do really? And I've been finding out from people who I really respect and who have made a huge impact that the answer is actually quite a lot. And, um, and it's just cool to think that all of us, regardless of how involved we are, regardless of whether we make um, a living off of off our, our conservation work or, you know, 60 bucks a month off our conservation work, um, most of which gets put back into the podcast. Um, it, it doesn't matter because we can all have this amazing impact. And that mm -hmm. goes back to like mm -hmm. y'all were saying, even just, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle and all the other Taylor Swift lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. It takes all types. And um, with, it's not something that like one group of people is going to solve the biodiversity crisis and climate change. It's going to it's literally it's going to take every one of us doing both things that we're passionate about and things that we're good at um, all at the same time. Yeah, I would have to say our executive director, uh, Charlie Redigan, mm -hmm. actually talks about how, what is it, we're greater than the sum. I always yeah. get that mixed up. Greater, greater than the, sum, than of the sum of our parts. So we have a research department, a rehab department, an education department, and none of us could function unless we had all of us together. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I always, I, I love that about music, too. That's my favorite thing. People ask me a lot why I... I like being a drummer so much because I'm in the back and I don't have a lot of like star turn moments, so to mm -hmm. speak. But my favorite thing about music is collaboration. I actually don't really love taking like big drum solos and stuff. It's not really my thing. I love knowing that I can make the singer feel better mm -hmm. and, and groove harder. And I know that <laughs> I can take a guitarist solo and find ways to accent it slightly that are going to make it sound funkier than it is, even if it's really <laughs> funky and stuff like that. Um, and it's the collaboration of music that I love, which made this last year pretty challenging as I was sitting in a room playing drums by myself. <laughs> yeah. It's not the most fun I've ever had. But, um, 
And I, I never thought of applying that like outside of the music world, but but now I'm seeing how oh, yeah. absolutely true that is, yeah. and it's it's very cool. Mm-hmm. Love that. So, um, is there anything else that either of you would like to highlight about mm. Vins or your lives or anything? Mm. Now I'm just thinking about. I can hear Anna T doing the one o'clock program. <laughs> her, her microphone's up really low. Gotcha. Loud. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would also say there is, I mean, it's kind of a downer, but <laughs> there is a, a new disease actually mm. that is kind of running rampant, uh, in the U S with birds specifically, it's affecting, uh, primarily grackles, blue jays and robins, I believe. And, uh, we still don't know what it is that is causing it. And I know there's been a lot of posts about it. There's been a lot of, uh, just a lot of media attention about it in general. But, um, yeah, it's the bird world is also going through a bit of a pandemic right now. Mm-hmm. So um, we're kind of uh, keeping an eye out and seeing what happens and what the cause of that is. I know I did a Zoo News story about this a couple weeks ago, but in case anyone missed that, can you tell me some things that people can do that are being suggested right now to maybe help mitigate that a little bit? I mean, it's it does seem to affect primarily backyard birds, like uh, blue jays, robins, grackles. So just keeping an eye on your feeders. If you're noticing any strange behavior, definitely call your local rehabber or call the state um, and game wardens, anybody to kind of let them know that you're seeing that so that we can have a record of where it's happening and get it documented and potentially try getting some tests done so that we can figure out what is what is actually the cause of all of this. Thankfully, in Vermont, I don't believe we've had any cases um, yet. I'm sure uh, we may uh, in the future, but it's, yeah, just calling calling rehabbers and calling the state to let them know that you're seeing strange behaviors with, with birds. What uh, What are the symptoms? So it's been primarily neurologic, I believe. So the birds just appear unbalanced, and then they have swollen, crusty, kind of discharge eyes as well. Yeah. Gross. Gross. Mm-hmm. And a general good practice... Um, for any time of the year, pandemic aside, is to keep your bird feeders clean. Mm -hmm. So should ever the birds empty it out before you refill it, just bring it inside and give it a really, really good scrub down with hot soapy water. I Um, feel like most people never, ever, ever clean their bird feeders. Yeah, clean your bird feeders. Yeah. (laughs) I actually know a lot of people that that never empty them fully. Like, they Mm -hmm. don't allow them to get empty. They fill them, Mm -hmm. you know, like Mm -hmm. from the halfway point or whatever. Oh, I see. So, um, yeah, I know multiple people that have feeders and do that. So, for those of you who listen... (laughs) Don't don't do that. Don't do that. Let them get empty and then bring them inside and wash them. Yeah. Yeah. Colin, there are some very specific people that I'm not saying your names right now, but you know I'm calling you out. So, uh, don't do that. And again, I know that, you know, all joking aside, though, like... People that are doing that think they're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, don't be offended. Don't be upset. Just no, take right. this as knowledge yeah. from experts because I didn't know that. I also don't have bird feeders. But I would probably do the same thing. Want to make sure there's always food there. It, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. However, cleaning them out is important. Even mm-hmm. when there isn't a weird zoonotic disease going through the community that nobody understands right now. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Fair, fair. <laughs> uh, so then how can people help Vins? Oh, yeah. There's so many ways. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's um, so we have a membership program if you're local to the area, and or if you're not, whatever. <laughs> I was um, just stared down. I think I'm now expected to become a member. Of no, I, I saw the look. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are members. Um, it's a yearly membership, and you get in free for that year, and some other cool benefits, including. Um, uh, free admission to other uh, special events that we might do. We've been doing some uh, like Zoom webinars and the like. Um, we also take volunteers. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, especially people who can who can dedicate a, a chunk of time and and will come back again and again because that's that's kind of the people that we need are people that are going to stick with us for a little while. Um, we also take donations of everything from your standard you know money to. Um, <laughs> To chickens. Well, yeah. Excuse me? We take chickens. We do take yeah. chickens. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how, why? Food. 
food mm-hmm. for our raptors. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. We have, there's several local farmers who know that they can bring us uh, unwanted roosters or laying hens that are past their prime um, so that we can uh, supplement our raptors diet with some extra meat. Because that's probably the biggest expense uh, at Vince is buying food for the birds. It is. I think it's about 50% of our total budget for our rehab department is just food alone. Wow. Yep. So... It is a lot of money. Yeah. Cool. Um, the last time that we did an interview, we talked about the banding program that y'all mm-hmm. had started. And at the time, I was all excited to hear stories. And I was like, have you heard back? And y'all were like, no, <laughs> this just started. So a year later, have we gotten any responses to banding? We have gotten one. Yeah. And it's it's not great, though. <laughs> so it. So it was actually a deceased barred owl. Um, it was actually found in the area where we had previously released it, and it had made it, um, I believe, a couple of months, but it, it was hit by a car. It was found on the side of the road, and someone reported the band, uh, and he actually came to us because he had initially been hit by a car. So it is, yeah. Uh, he so did not learn. It was uh, not a good band return, but it's still information regardless. So we've banded, I want to say, 60, 70 more birds since then. We have not gotten any returns on those. So, yeah. But also not returns for, for people, if you missed the first episode or don't remember this part, are actually a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's not easy to read a band, and, right? Correct, yeah. So I think the fact that we're not hearing is is a good sign we'll take it as a good sign yeah that works okay very cool um anything else before we get to uh the poop story poop story the poop story poop story all right it's time now don't you know we've come to the end of the show but there's one tale left to go you're gonna laugh and say oh no it's time for the rossifari poop story Hit me. <laughs> you wanna? Uh, I'll okay. take one from I have each a, of you if you I want. I have a good. I have one um, that's like somewhat education related, but also super gross. Um, hey. <laughs> so we have one of our uh, camp weeks of camp are sixth through eighth graders that do ad- advanced soar science of amazing raptors, and <laughs> they nice. get to, they get to do um, necropsies or dissections of some of our deceased. Um, patients from Sixth whoever. to eighth graders get to do get that's to do amazing. on owls and hawks and falcons and it's like I if I was a sixth grader who got to do this I would have died. These guys are pretty I don't know they're jaded or something but they were like this is cool I guess. <laughs> um, um, no, we had a great time and one so one of the broadwing hawks that we no it was a red tail one of the red tails that we were dissecting. Um, this young man opened up the body cavity so we could look at the different organs inside and it just had a massive, massive stomach. Like the stomach was totally distended and bloated and gross. And I was like, don't touch that. (laughs) Please don't open that. We're all going to regret it because it's going to smell really bad. And then, so we kept, kept going along and looking at the intestines. And I noticed that there was like these weird, like curly little things in coming out of the intestines and it was dead pinworms so this poor red tail had a lot of very mature worms living in his lower intestines um that probably had he not died of something related to the fact that he had giant worms in his intestines those would have been coming out in his poop and i know that you've had You've had, like, pigeons pooping exclusively worms Oh, um, in yeah. rehab this summer. Yeah. Even yeah. even owls that cast up pellets that have full worms in yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. Yeah. And not mm-hmm. like earthworms, like like intestinal worms. Like, yeah. Ugh, I don't like, I you know, I'm not grossed out by doing a necropsy on, like, an otherwise healthy bird. Mm-hmm. I think that's, it's cool. You know when the tissue looks healthy. Great. If it's an unhealthy bird, this really gross. <laughs> Brought to you by Swibber, Yay, Center birds. for Wild Bird Rehab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ew. Yep. Yep. <laughs> the worms. Um, I guess my story is, I mean, something I guess I'm proud of. So we uh, we had a, I want to say it was actually a red-shouldered hawk in uh, last year that we were we were doing an exam or we had just finished medicating it and I 
was feeling around on the abdomen and happened to notice all of a sudden that it was a very, very full abdomen. So I went and I was pressing on it a little bit and it just, all the contents just like shot out of that bird. Um, they are projectile poopers. So it's, it's meant to just like shoot, skyrocket out of them. And I thankfully could see that that hat was going to happen and jumped out of the way and I did not get any on me. Nice. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they give you, especially the projectile pooping hawks, they give you a little bit of warning. They do. You know, especially like a bird sitting on glove, that tail will start to go up and then it comes out. Yeah. So you can get out of the way usually. Yeah. Yeah. It was... It was very gross poop. Yeah. Probably had worms in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. So my grandma always told me that getting, you know, pooped on by a bird was, was good luck. As a matter of fact, one time in Atlantic City, I got pooped on uh, by a bird, and she wouldn't let me wash it off because we were going to gamble. And um, she really believed this. You are here to tell me that this is, in fact, not true. I did win $200 that day. So it, I, we'd both have to be the luckiest. I know. Like if that's true, <laughs> if that's true. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't feel so lucky. I don't feel. So. <laughs> I mean, in certain ways, yes. I have to say, I'm an incredibly just lucky person, but not a win the lottery kind of lucky person. <laughs> Fair, fair. All right. Well, thank you both so much for doing this again. It's been a blast. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Oh, but wait, there's more. After that incredible interview, we decided to head to the hospital for an audio tour. There's uh, there's some interesting stuff in here, so uh, enjoy, y'all. All right. So this is the hospital. Is the hospital very exciting? And it is covered in bird feathers right now. <laughs> so uh, this is actually our intake area right here, where mm-hmm. we intake any of the new patients that we're getting in, and we have a huge database where we input all the patient info onto our computer so that we we know exactly where they came from, who brought them in, and whatnot. And this is kind of our general hub area. So, yes, meat cleaver with a bloody... Uh, <laughs> this uh, is just for when the rehabs don't work out. Yeah, yeah. So it's our, uh, we call it our commissary area, and it's kind of the general hub of the whole entire building where we do all of our meal prep for all of our exhibit birds, all of the rehab patients, and uh, all dishes, all the laundry, everything gets done kind of right in this general vicinity. It is, again, a total mess right now. We have a whole entire bucket full of just old meat scraps. So. Oh. <laughs> wow, I'm so glad I'm back here. <laughs> and that's oh, that's actually, a puppy. Yes, yeah, so this is, Bear will be on a podcast. <laughs> So this is actually our, our break room slash hey. offices oh. slash laundry room. Um, and this is Bear. Hi, uh, Bear. He's, he's Bren's dog. He's very friendly. Hi, bud. Waiting for my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's not not a whole lot going on in here. There's so. a dog. Yeah, there I'm, is. I'm very there happy. Is a dog. Yes. <laughs> Bye, Bear. I have. I actually have a locker in there filled with all of the clothing items that people bring birds in. Oh, and nice. We keep talking about how we're going to have a fashion show because <laughs> we just get like weird crop tops or like shorts that are just like, what are what are we doing here, guys? So, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. So. This is our exam room area. This is where we do all of the treatments on all of our rehab patients. When we get new patients in, this is where we do all of our exams on them. We've got our scale, all of our medications. Um, We have our centrifuge for blood work, our oxygen uh, chamber, and anything else we would ever need. And, uh, you know, a a window shelf full of uh, various bird pieces that we've <laughs> saved in formalin. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Yeah. And this area, I actually, so this is 
this is our ICU, and we won't actually go in sure, there sure. because we have patients in there currently. Um, but it is basically two separate rooms. We have six larger indoor stalls, and then we have a bunch of smaller uh, cube units and uh, bins that we keep the birds in, and um, it's kind of our first stop for, for all of our patients here. Cool. And so this area is actually, we... We call it the weathering yard, but it actually used to be where a lot of our rehab patients, are, or not our rehab patients, our education birds were housed, oh, and nice. we now have repurposed it into uh, more rehab patient uh, stall space. So we've got a great blue heron, we have uh, two common ravens in here, we have three barred owls in there, we have a hooded merganser and a common merganser, a mallard duckling, everything wow. kind of all... Uh, in this area. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I he, This guy actually was just moved out here this morning. So I don't even know where he is. but I can hear him. Yeah, you can see we have, a, like, this is a very heron-specific setup. So we have anti-fatigue mats on the ground uh, so he doesn't get foot sores. We have kind of a sheet so that he has a nice little area to hide behind. And we have um, larger... Uh, there he is. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Oh, my God. <laughs> larger Hello. branches for him to kind of mosey around in yeah wow. he came in very very emaciated it's the time of year where we're getting a lot of juvenile herons who just were not cutting it out in the wild came in a little thin and uh we're kind of building them back up for release so yeah wow <laughs> that that is an amazing just part. sort of emerged seriously <laughs> that was really cool Bear. <laughs> Hi, Bear. <laughs> and this is actually our flight cage. So we currently have two bald eagles in there nice. right now that we're trying to get um, all exercised up um, for release. And it's this is kind of our last stop for most of our raptors. So we, we want to make sure that they're all flighted and doing really well after their injuries. And... This is Ogden, actually. Hello. So she Hello. is a retired education bird. She's, Hi, Ogden. She's 40 years old. Wow. She's my favorite education bird on campus. Um, she is so nice for, for a vulture. They can be really mean. I'm sure others who have worked with vultures know that they can be very mean, but she's a very nice bird. She's been in retirement for about two years now, so we kind of have taken on a lot of her care in her old age. Nice. So she gets to spend her day sunning in this big window and gets to watch as people go by bringing us birds. That's cool. Why are you holding your pants up like that, huh? <laughs> She's gorgeous. She is. She's beautiful. <laughs> and then we have uh, more outdoor st stall space. So we have four four larger outdoor enclosures. We have three red tails, some songbirds, some merlin, and two crows in there. And we have um, you know other songbird aviaries for our our fledgling baby songbirds that we have in care. And we currently have seven chimney swifts out there right now. And then that's actually going to be our waterfowl enclosure. So it's nice. a huge, huge pool. Yes, there's it's your hot tub. very <laughs> specific to um, a waterfowl needs, and we're excited to get it going. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to use it for this season, but it is, uh, yeah, definitely going to be very, very necessary. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. And, yeah, I can show you Queechy as yes, well. Yes, 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 please. Oh, you know what I did not ask about, and yeah. I know this isn't exactly your department, but uh, how's my buddy Turt doing? Turt? Yeah. She's doing great. Good. She, um, I feel like there aren't a lot of updates when you're talking about a wood turtle, but, I, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, worth asking. She's keeping on, keeping on. Like, she, <laughs> she eats every day. She gets to go outside, be in the sun. I actually think she's been on a lot of programs recently, so she's been on the road a lot. Going nice. Going to different outreaches and Same. Seeing, a lot, <laughs> seeing a lot of people. Um, so in here we actually have Queechy, our blue jay. Oh, there you are. He's collecting rocks right now. Oh, yeah. On the ground hey, there. Um, so he actually, 
uh, was a, a pretty interesting story in that he was found in Queechy, Vermont, which is actually where Vins is located. Um, and oh, hey, bud. He actually flew onto our assistant executive director's head while she was out at a restaurant, and it became very apparent that he uh, had been raised by by people and uh, became imprinted and was either released or escaped and found his way over at this restaurant and saw a bunch of people and thought, hey, I'm going to go say hi to Given all the these people. the fact that he people. just came so, to say <laughs> hi to us, that makes sense. Yeah. Hi, you like it when we talk, don't you? He is going through a rough molt right now, as you can see. <laughs> he is completely bald on his head and his neck. Um, he <laughs> He looks, he looks terrible. <laughs> In an adorable way? Yeah. Question mark. He and our, <laughs> our educators have been working a lot with him to get him to do different behaviors. But mm-hmm. he also is a great mimic. So he does uh, a crow call, and it is, but it's a crow call. From a distance, because that's what he hears, is crows in the oh, distance. Wow. So it's not like, you know, a crow right next to you. He, it's like, oh, I'm hearing crows off in the distance. And he does robin begging calls. I've heard him do some raven calls wow. as well. So he he's definitely has picked up on a few things. Yeah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> you are really, that molt is something special. Yeah, he looks like, a, like an old man. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> So cute, though. Oh, my goodness. You're so curious. He's, yes, he's very friendly. So, yeah. And, I mean, with imprinted birds specifically, we kind of have to socialize them a little bit more because they are imprinted, so their natural behavior is going to be is going to want to be around people. Right. Um, and if we're not giving them that, then it's uh, more, more of a disservice to them because they're not getting the interaction that they're desperately looking for. That makes sense. So... Is that um, we don't encourage it, but here for for these guys, we um, we want to make sure he's getting no, getting right. the interaction. And <laughs> I knew you were gonna go after my phone. I knew you would. He's so cute, though. He looks like a little vulture. <laughs> like, he really almost. does. I mean, this is honestly amazing. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you're gonna be a star, Queechy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate all of this. Yeah, You're the no coolest. problem. Thank you. Y'all, Queechee was adorable. Bear was adorable. The heron was incredible. Gray and Anna were pretty cool, too. No, seriously, how amazing was just all of that. I just, I love these people and animals so much. Uh, Thank you to everyone at Vins for being a part of the podcast again. I really, really appreciate it. And y'all, if you want to check out Vins, you can find them online at www.vinsweb.org and on social media at Vins Raptors. And until next week, remember... Friends, the word credits backwards is Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.